the ROV subsequently found additional debris. The debris is consistent with the catastrophic loss. Recent news about the unfortunate fate of the Titan submersible and the lives that have perished has shattered our spirits. But was it preventable? Many things have to go wrong for such a catastrophe to happen. As we reflect on this incident and seek to understand what has gone beneath the surface, I am compelled to think about the design and engineering that has underpinned this ambitious project. Let us try to analyze the challenges faced by the Titan submersible and examine the potential shortcomings in its structural design that might have led to such catastrophic failure. Analyzing any structure and its behavior consists of three parts. The first is to understand various forces or loads acting on the structure. The second is the material that the structure is made up of. And the third is the geometry of the structure. Let us try to understand forces that a deep dive submersibles are subjected to. A submersible that is designed to explore titanic wreck is meant to dive up to 4000 meters. That is 4 kilometers or 2.48 miles approximately. As the submersible dives deeper, the external water pressure increases in proportion to the depth of submersible. To be precise, the pressure, that is a force per unit area, acting on any submerged object is given by the product of the depth of the object, the density of the liquid, and the acceleration due to gravity. Titanic is submerged at a depth of 3.8 kilometers. The pressure at that depth is around 37 million pascals or 37 megapascals or 5,400 PSI. That is approximately equivalent to having 35 elephants stand on your shoulder. For any submerged object, the hydrostatic forces are compressive in nature and they act radially inward. That is, the Titan submersible would have been subjected to immense amount of compressive forces from all the direction when in such depths. Any structural damage or breach of hull would lead to immediate implosion in milliseconds when the pressure is in the range of 5400 psi. That is, the most obvious mode of failure in deep sea vessels is the breach of hull which could lead to catastrophic implosion. Given such high stakes and when so many things could go wrong, designing such vessels needs precise engineering aided with computer simulations and finally tons of on-site testing until a satisfactory design is obtained. This was also noted by James Cameron, the Oscar-winning Titanic movie director and a prominent figure in deep dive community who has himself visited Titanic wreck site 33 times. Design subs, implosion is obviously the, the specter that looms over us all the time. But because of that, that's the thing that you engineer for the most years in advance. So that should never be the problem. I've never believed that if I was you know, going to have a serious problem in a sub that it would be implosion. Maybe entanglement in a fishing net, maybe a fire from the electronics. Hard to rule those things out. Implosion, absolutely not. Especially with modern finite element analysis and, uh, you know, computer-aided design. The Titan submersible was made up of three primary structural elements. It consisted of a carbon fiber hull that was five inches thick and capped by two titanium domes. The vessel also had a viewport that was useful to see underwater life and Titanic's wreck. Let's talk about the carbon fiber composite hull. Using carbon fiber composite hull is not conventional. In fact, numerous state-of-the-art and successful deep dive submersibles use steel and titanium in their hull and not carbon fiber composites. Ocean Gate CEO Stockton Rush said in an interview two years ago that he had broken some rules by foregoing conventional materials in the design of Titan submersible. Broken some rules to make this. I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me. The carbon fiber and titanium, there's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. The carbon fiber composite, by their very nature, are excellent material to resist tensile stresses. However, they can be susceptible to compression under very high pressure that may lead to brittle failure without much warning. The loss of strength in carbon fiber composites can happen due to four primary reasons. The first is debonding, which is loss of adhesion between the fibers and the matrix. And the second is fiber breakage, that is the fiber of the composite material itself can experience breakage due to excessive stresses. The third is delamination, which is the separation of various layers or plies in the composite material. And finally, we have matrix cracking. That is the possibility of having cracks in the matrix of the composite material, 
which can occur due to excessive load or manufacturing defect. In addition, the carbon fiber composite materials are susceptible to impact and abrasion damage. This is highly likely at Titanic wreckage site because it's a very hostile place with numerous corroded and twisted steel beams spread across the seabed. This also increases the probability of the vessel getting entangled in Titanic's wreck. In addition to research activities, the Titan submersible was supposed to carry tourists to the Titanic wreckage site. This would mean large number of trips to such large depth, and that could introduce fatigue in the carbon fiber composite material when subjected to repeated cyclical loading. Over time, cyclic loading can initiate and propagate crack inside the material, which in case of carbon fiber composites could lead to implosion without any warning. Another issue with the carbon fiber composite hull is the possibility of manufacturing defects, which could lead to air bubbles or voids in the composite material which in turn could lead to local loss of stiffness and hence loss of strength. When the structure is subjected to such large forces, it is important to make sure that there are no cracks in the hull. However, it is extremely challenging to perform non-destructive evaluation to infer the health of the hull, especially at the micro scales. Titan was made for five passengers. That is, it was a relatively bigger vessel in terms of size and capacity as compared to the average size of the deep dive submersibles. Now that would require a larger cylindrical hull, structurally speaking, a hollow cylinder with a larger diameter. A cylinder with a larger diameter is more susceptible to structural stability loss. For example, the carbon composite hull could buckle under the compressive forces transferred through the titanium domes when the pressure is so high. In addition to considering for the hull design, there are three other structural elements that need serious considerations. Firstly, we have titanium domes. Geometrically, domes are suitable to resist compressive forces and titanium is a strong and ductile material. The second is the viewport that needs to be designed and preferably certified for a depth of 4,000 meters in case of Titan submersible. The lawsuit by the former employee of Ocean Gate pointed out that the viewport was certified only for a depth of 1,300 meters. And finally, there are connections, that is things like bolts, welds, or seals that connects various structural elements together. Failure in any one of these elements, that is the carbon fiber composite hull, the domes, the viewport or the connections can lead to implosion. Now we don't precisely know what caused the implosion of Titan submersible. However, amongst all these elements, the carbon fiber hull and the viewport are most susceptible to damage. We make a very crucial observation here. Given the loads and choices of materials, the structural engineer can design for the geometry to build a safe structure. However, given such immense amount of compressive forces acting on the submersible, there is very little room for engineering error. Therefore, any gaps or concerns must be filled in order to cover for the foreseeable risks. Since Titan was one of a kind experimental submersible that was larger in size and made up of carbon fiber composite hull, it would have been wise to get it certified from a reputable organization even if such certification was not required by law. As we will see, there were numerous known dangers that were ignored and the need for certification simply felt unnecessary. The ex-marine director of OceanGate, David Lockridge, raised concerns about Titan's design and was later fired. He in turn sued the company. When David Lockridge was preparing the safety report, he requested for paperwork from the engineering director regarding the viewport design and pressure test results. He was met with hostility and denied access to these documents. When his verbal warnings were ignored, he submitted a written report that listed numerous issues that posted serious safety concerns for the passengers. Lockridge expressed concerns regarding the lack of non-destructive testing performed on the hull of the Titan. And the lawsuit details Lockridge's worry that visible flaws in the carbon fiber supplied to Ocean Gate raised the risk of small flaws expanding into larger tears during pressure cycle. These are the huge pressure changes that the submersible would experience as it made its way to and from the deep ocean floor. He noted that a previously tested scale model of the hull had prevalent flaws. Lockridge claimed he believed the company could subject passengers to potential extreme dangers in an experimental submersible. Lockridge reported finding that the vessel's front viewport was only certified to a depth of about 4,200 feet, that is 1,300 meters, and far less than the depth of Titan. Lockridge was not the only one to leave the company over the safety concerns. Rob McCallum, an explorer and the former consultant to OceanGate, 
urged Ocean Gate CEO to stop using the sub until an independent body assessed it. He left the company in 2009. The company's approach to certification was raised by the professional trade group Marine Technology Society in their 2018 letter. Here is what Will Cohen, the chairman of the Manned Underwater Vehicles Committee of Marine Technology Society, had to say about the Titan Submersible. As chairman of the Submersible Committee, uh, I stand by the letter. In the very, very deep submersibles, like the 4,000 meters deep, there are only 10 vehicles in the whole world that can go 4,000 meters or deeper, and all of them are certified except the Titan. So it is an outlier. Experts in the industry at the conference voiced concern, what are we going to do? This is very risky. Uh, we understand the, the strategy, but it is very risky for everybody. In a 2019 blog, OceanGate defended their decision to not class their vessels, saying accidents in marine and aviation settings mostly results from operational errors, not mechanical failures. This is the portion of a legal disclaimer that every passenger has to sign before boarding the Titan. An experimental submersible vessel that has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body and could result in physical injury, disability, emotional trauma, or death. Where do I sign? Titan also faced numerous electrical system errors and communication flaws. When David Pogue, a CBS correspondent, was invited to dive in the Titan submersible, he reported that the Titan went missing for several hours when he was on the mothership. Pogue also revealed that the craft lacked emergency location transmitters that would emit signals and that could help rescuers to find the craft in case it was lost. He also noted the improvised nature of several components of the craft. And yet, I couldn't help noticing how many pieces of this sub seemed improvised. We can use these off-the-shelf components. I got these from uh, Camper World. We run the whole thing with this game controller. <laughs> Come on! It seems like this submersible has some elements of MacGyver-y jerry-riggedness. I mean, you're putting construction pipes as ballast. I don't know if I'd use that description of it, um, but there's certain things that you want to be uh, buttoned down. So the pressure vessel is not macgyver at all because that's where we work with Boeing and NASA and the University of Washington. Everything else can fail. Your thrusters can go, your lights can go, you're still going to be safe. It is hard to precisely point out what led to the implosion. Numerous red flags and some avoidable mistakes, or perhaps sheer bad luck, might have led to this catastrophe. While accepting unforeseen risks is a part of life, however, ignoring foreseeable risks is not only foolish but also unnecessary. James Cameron puts it very articulately in his interview. The irony is that the Titanic sank because of bad seamanship. The captain was warned and he took a, he took a decision to go full speed into a known ice field that was that he had Marconi gram, you know, telegrams in his pocket, um, warning about the ice ahead. And on a moonless night where they couldn't see anything, they just steamed full speed ahead. And I kind of feel that that's what happened here. I, I feel that this is, this was such a preventable tragedy. We've never had a tragedy like this in the entire history of deep submergence. As we forge ahead, we must make sure that the lessons learned from this tragedy informs and guides our future endeavors by keeping in mind a delicate balance between pushing the boundaries and safety. And finally, my heart goes to the families and friends who have suffered such a tremendous loss. In these tough times, more power to you.